Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. On the video today, guys, I'm going to show you inside of the simulator what happens if an aircraft turned too much. What happens if you overbank or if you get into an upset uh, situation where the aircraft is turned completely all over. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why we bank as much as we do during normal operations. And I will also explain a bit about the systems behind. So stay tuned. <laughs> This video is brought to you in cooperation with Skillshare. Now, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of high quality courses in pretty much any subject that you can imagine. If you want to improve on your public speaking skills or you want to uh, learn how to fly using your own flight simulator at home, well, then the 501st of you who uses this link here below will get two months of premium membership of Skillshare absolutely for free. So, check it out. Right guys, so the bank angles of an aircraft, as in how much the aircraft is tipping over as it's turning, is something that I know is causing a lot of concern to a lot of people out there. I always get questions, so why does the aircraft have to, to turn that much, you know, it's really scary. Well, in order to understand that, we need to first of all understand how it works, you know, what kind of systems are involved. And then we need to understand whether or not it's actually dangerous to make high bank angles. And, you know, at what point does it become a problem? So, first of all, the systems involved. So, we have two different flight control surfaces that we use to turn the aircraft in its roll axis, as in, like this. The, the first primary rudders we're using are ailerons. Those are the little rudders that you can see on the tip or close to the tip of the wings, on the trailing edges of the wings. And the way that they will work is that they literally decrease the amount of lift the wing has on that side and increases on the other side if it wants to turn or roll the aircraft like this. Now, on top of that, we also have something called flight spoilers. And flight spoilers are those little flaps that you can see on the top side of the wing and the way that they work is similar. Um, they will come up on the side that we want to drop. So by doing so, they also decrease a little bit of lift on that wing, makes that wing drop, and subsequently the other one will go up. So those are the systems um, on the rudders involved. They are hydraulically actuated, but they're also connected through wires from our yoke out through the wings to activate the um, at least the ailerons, not the flight spoilers. So why do we have to bank them? Well, in order for you guys not to be like you would be if you were sitting in a rally car and we suddenly turned sharply to left or right, you would be pushed out towards the outside of the turn. Okay, so we, want, we don't want that. We want you to have a pleasant ride. Okay, and the only way that we can do that is by both turning the aircraft in its yaw axis like this, and we do that using the rudder and the yaw damper, and also in its roll axis, like this. If we combine those two movements, it means that the aircraft will make a nice coordinated turn, and you will be able to sit in your seat with a cup of coffee, and the only way that you will notice that you're turning is by looking out and seeing that you're actually banking. Okay, so that's a coordinated turn, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, when we turn during normal operations, we want to try to achieve something called a rate one turn. That is a turn that gives us three degrees of heading difference per second. It means it takes us one minute to turn the aircraft 180 degrees around, and it takes us two minutes to make a complete circle. The reason we want to do a rate one turn is because air traffic control need to be able to know how quickly we will achieve the heading they have given us, um, and it also gives some kind of structure to, for example, holding patterns, how long a holding pattern will take. So we do that, and in 737, given the normal speeds that we fly, uh, that means that we need to bank with about 25 to 30 degrees. So when you're out flying, when we initiate a, a turn, we, you will see about 30 degrees of bank. Very rarely, or almost never, anything more than that. The only reason that we would ever turn with more bank angle than that would be to avoid an obstacle or to get ourselves out of an upset um, situation, which is what I will show you soon in the video coming up. Um, but during our training, when we do our type rating, 
we do something called a steep turn maneuver. And that is a turn that we initiate to 45 degrees, so 15 degrees more bank than we would during um, a normal turn. The reason we're doing that is because it's a great way of, of increasing the, what we call the scan speed of the pilot. We have to, as pilot, be able to interpret a lot of different instrumentation in real time in order to understand what the aircraft is doing. And on our primary flight display, which is the instrument that we have straight in front of us, we have the, um, the attitude indicator in the middle that shows us how much we are pitching up and down and how much we're turning left and right and gives us the horizon. We also have to the left the airspeed, to the right we have the, um, the altitude and below we can see our heading. To the far right we also have something called an IVSI which is an instantaneous vertical speed indicator. Now all of those instruments will be involved when we're doing a steep turn. Um, when you're doing a steep turn, as in when the bank angle is increased above the normal 30 degrees, um, you will also have an increase in load factor. You have a small increase in load factor already at 30 degrees, but it's not that much. Now the load factor is, is there because um, when you're flying an aircraft in level flight, the, uh, the lift from the wings is perpendicular to the wing, so it's straight up. So if you're flying like this, you can imagine that the lift is going straight up like that in order to keep the altitude. But as we're turning like this, now the lift from the wing is still perpendicular, right? But all of a sudden, instead of being a lift vector like this, it's now a lift vector like that. So this means that the actual part of the force that is keeping us at the altitude is much smaller and you have a side vector as well, right? So given that, if you need to maintain your altitude, you understand that you need to actually pull a little bit on the elevator as well in order to make the lift higher, bigger, to get the same uh, vector keeping us at altitude. So that's what we have to do. As you initiate the turn, coming up to 30 degrees, you have a little bit of back pressure using your elevator. When you're increasing the turn even further than that, you now need to pull more and more on your elevator to maintain the altitude. But when you're doing so, you're actually increasing your drag as well. So you need to add a little bit of thrust. And the stalled speed of the aircraft, as in the, the speed where the wing is not aerodynamically effective anymore when it starts to fall, that increases with the square root of the load factor. So this means that from zero the degrees of bank up to 30, there's not too much increase of the stall speed. But as you go up to 45, it's a bit more. As you go up to 60, it's even more, and it increases exponentially. So you will see this in the video very, very soon, when I start to go up to 60 degrees and beyond, that it is almost impossible to maintain the altitude of the aircraft. You have to pull a lot on a yoke in order to maintain altitude. And as we do so, you can see on the speed tape that the stall speed, the little red barber's pulse, is going to come shooting up from below. And if eventually, if you continue to do that, continue to pull, I will stall the aircraft and have to recover it out of the stall. Okay? So this is something that's worth noting before we start looking at the video. Now what I want you to look at specifically is um, how the aircraft, the warning systems that the aircraft has. Um, for example, when we bank more than 30 degrees, nothing happens up to 35 degrees, but at 35 degrees the uh, bank angle indicator, which is at the top of the primary flight display, will turn amber. And then at 35 degrees we get an oral warning from the aircraft saying bank angle, bank angle. And that warning will repeat itself for each 5 degrees more. So at 35 degrees, at 40 degrees and at 45 degrees. Now if we don't do anything, it's just a one-time warning. It will not be continuous like a stick shaker or a stall warning would be. Um, but look at that, look at what happens to the instrumentations and specifically look at what happens to the stall speed when I increase the bank angle further. Now in the middle, or sorry, at the end of the video, I will be showing you an upset as well. Now, there is no way that a, an aircraft flying in commercial operation would ever roll, okay? The only reason that a commercial pilot would ever consider rolling an aircraft is if we would end up in an upset maneuver after, for example, having hit the wake turbulence behind a heavy aircraft in front. This is why we have separation in time 
and in altitude between aircraft to make sure that we don't find ourselves in situations like that. But if we do, if the aircraft is being flipped over more than 90 degrees, it might actually be quicker to continue the roll in order to get back up straight again than it would be to stop the roll and go back. So this is one of the few reasons, and I will show you this, that we would ever do that. Now some of you will ask, well, I've seen, I've seen a 707 roll. And it's true. Uh, um, a, there was a famous test pilot called um, uh, Tex Johnson, who was a test pilot on the Boeing 707, who did a barrel roll in front of thousands of people in Seattle back in the, um, back in the day. But uh, what you have to understand is that is a, uh, it's a, first of all, it's a barrel roll. It's a, it's a controlled maneuver, which is only subjecting the aircraft to 1G. It means that there's no increase in load factor if you do that correctly. And it was done by a pilot who was highly skilled, trained in an empty aircraft with loads of excess thrust. You would never ever see a real aircraft in transport with passengers on board do something like that. So enjoy the video. Make sure that you send in your questions afterwards. Right, everybody, very welcome to VA Airline Training's brand spanking new 737 simulator here in Cambridge. Um, what we are going to do and what I'm going to show you today is uh, basically what happens if we overbank an aircraft. Um, the first part of the exercise is something that we do during the type rating, which is to um, we make the aircraft bank to 45 degrees, which is about 15 degrees more than you will ever, uh, ever fly and experience as a passenger. And the reason for the exercise is to increase the, um, the pilot scan speed. It means that it, it helps us to practice, to watch all of our instruments at once, basically, to make sure that we can maintain a certain value. Um, but what I will show you is also what happens when we increase the bank angle even further. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to um, establish the aircraft here at about 10,000 feet at about 250 knots. We are at a suddenly heading now, 180 degrees. Um, we will make a 360 degree turn to the left to start with. So the first thing I will do is I will initiate the turn with a normal bank angle, as in so much that you are used to when you're sitting as passengers. So here we are, we're about 28 degrees bank at the moment. So 28 to 30 degrees is something that you would have seen normally. And as you can see on the horizon, you know, it's, it's a fairly, you know, it's fairly high bank angle, but it's not that much. Now, as I increase the bank angle, it becomes harder and harder to maintain the altitude. And that is because of the secondary effect of the elevators. So here we are, 10,000 feet, and we'll increase it now to 45 degrees bank. And as I do so, I add a little bit of thrust because we will get bank more angle. and more drag. Bank angle. So that's the bank angle warnings. You can see it slightly above two and a half degrees bank pitch angle. up. Bank angle. And as you can see, it's very easy to get bank the aircraft angle. to start into the sand. Bank angle. So here we are, a little bit more than 45 degrees of bank. And it's maintaining the uh, altitude quite okay at the moment. But I do need quite a bit of back pressure now in order to maintain the altitude. Now, you should not use the trim in this case. So do not trim the aircraft when you do this exercise. Because when you do, if when you are about to level off the turn, you're then going to start climbing. So I've lost about 100 feet there, try to regain that. So I decrease the bank angle, get it back up again a little bit, and then I increase the bank angle again. Like that. So now we'll increase the bank even further to 60 degrees. Bank angle. Now here, we bank need angle. a significant amount of back pressure. And as you can see, at the bottom of the speed indicator there, we're starting to see the barber's poles. Bank angle. Bank angle. I'll go through 180 degrees just to continue to show you. Go all the way up to 60 degrees. And as you can see, as I'm increasing now, Bank angle. Bank angle. the aircraft stalls. We roll out of the bank and stabilize the aircraft again. So that's a good example of, of the um, stall speed increasing as you're increasing the G-forces that you're taking up of the, um, of the aircraft. So, since the stall speed increases with the square root of the, uh, the g-force that you're taking out, uh, 
as we're banking normal degrees, so at about 30 degrees or so, it's not too much happening. But as you increase to 45 degrees, a little bit more at 60 degrees, you have an almost 40% increase. And as you go further than that, we land the stall speed would increase to about 100%. So let's see, I'm not I'm talking too much, flying too little at the moment. But you're getting back to, to a flight level 100 and 250 knots. And I'll show you that thing again. A little bit of thrust off initially here. Establish the aircraft at 10,000 feet. And then we initiate a bank in the other direction instead. So that's coming up to 30 degrees of bank. Just a little bit of back pressure needed, very little. But as you pass 30 degrees, increase a little bit of thrust. Increase the bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle. 45 degrees, and there goes a little bit of a descent. Correct that immediately. Do not. It's very easy to, <laughs> to get into the habit of trimming, but do not do that. And there we go. It seems like 3 degrees pitch up will maintain the altitude quite nicely at this speed and at this altitude because this all differs depending on what altitude you're at. So now if you now increase the bank further, bank angle. Bank angle. increase the thrust further, more bank back angle. pressure needed, bank angle. even more thrust needed, bank angle. more back pressure bank needed. Angle. And here we're up to almost 60 degrees, which makes it almost impossible to maintain. And, there we go. and that's the stall speed coming up. So decreasing the bank angle, rolling it out. And getting it back to 250 knots. So the Boeing 737 is an air transport category aircraft. It is not built to do aerobatics with. And you can, as you can clearly see, as the bank angle goes over 60 degrees, the aircraft start to have problems maintaining the um, maintaining well above stall speed basically. So I've had a lot of questions. Can you roll a 737? And uh, the answer to that is, it is possible to roll it. You are going to need extra airspeed, so you're going to do it in a descent. Uh, but it is not something that you would ever see anyone do, not even during flight shows. The only chance that you will get to see that would be if an aircraft would be in an actual upset. So that would be if we would end up in the vortexes behind another aircraft, for example, and the aircraft gets turned over its keel, and the quickest way to regain uh, a normal kind of sunny side up attitude is to roll around it. So that's the only time that you would ever see um, something like that happening. But if we would be in a situation like that, I'll see if I can induce it and I'll see if I can show it to you. Ready? Yep. Bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle, bank angle. And there we are. But as you can see, guys, this is never something you would ever want to find yourself in. And if you do, you have to react very, very quickly to it. Um, it's, it's very close to the maximum structural load that the aircraft can take. Um, and if we pull too much in any direction, um, it, it's, you, you could actually structurally damage the aircraft. So um, this is why we practice. We don't practice um, scenarios as extreme as this. as because of an aircraft the size of the 737, it's very unlikely that even if they enter into um, a wake turbulence, that we would actually be flicked more than 90 degrees off. Um, 
but if we do, it is possible to do it, but you have to react lightning fast if it happens. Right, I hope you enjoyed that. You might ask yourself, has this actually happened in real life? And it has. So there was a, uh, a famous incident of a Learjet 45 in Mexico City that crashed inside of central parts of Mexico City due to having got into the wake turbulence of a much larger aircraft in front. Now they were flipped completely over, but they did not have enough altitude to, to regain full control before they hit the building. Because as you could see on the video, we do lose quite a lot of altitude during a maneuver like that. I want to say a special thank you as well to uh, VA Airline Training, who let me borrow their flight simulator up in Cambridge yesterday. And I also want to send a specific thank you to the sponsors of this episode, which is Skillshare. Now, Skillshare, if you haven't checked them out, I highly recommend you to do so. Uh, they're an online learning community with thousands of courses in mm, mm, pretty much anything that I have ever, ever looked for inside, I've found something about, okay? Something that would be specifically interesting for you would be their um, the course in how to use your home flight simulator in order to prepare for your private pilot license. So just go into Skillshare, use the link here below, the 501st that does so will get two months of their premium membership completely for free. So you can just use that link, type in pilot or flying and you'll find that course and it will help you to prepare for your PPL. So have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are out there. Continue to send in your questions. Make sure that you have liked and subscribed the channel and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.